All right, so the 4th of July is near, and in this video, we are going to be making a 4Q fireworks igniter. Now, I actually did a video on making one of these things a long time ago, and I basically just did an overview of the wiring. This time, I'm going to show you how to do everything on it, so kind of a full tutorial. So this whole thing is going to be based off of one of these guys. This is a four-channel relay module, and this, if we open it up, So four relays in it, a lot of uh, simple screw terminals. Uh, there's a button on it, I'll show you what that's for in a minute. And this just comes with a little remote here. So remote actually has a cover on it. Uh, it doesn't seem like I can push the buttons through the cover anymore. The old one that I had, I could actually push on this little cover and the buttons would uh, still press, but that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. It seems like they've improved these. So anyhow, four buttons on that. It's got a little antenna. This will have uh, quite a good range and we'll take it outside and test that later. Obviously we gotta build it before we can test the range, so. All right, so this module, if you buy it straight from China uh, through Amazon, you can get it for about 10 bucks. If you buy it within the United States, it costs about 13 or 14. And then obviously it gets shipped faster if you do that. So that's one of the parts you need. You will need some butt connectors. And we're actually going after the piece of metal that's on the inside of these butt connectors. And I'll show you an easy way to get that out, but if you want to or can find these things for cheap that don't have the uh, insulation on them, that's probably an easier option. But uh, anyway, 100 of these cost about five bucks and you'll, uh, 100 of these will last for quite some time. And I'll show you what we use this for in a minute. Uh, we need some wire. This is 50 foot worth of 18 gauge so-called zip wire. Also used for like lamp cords and things like that. I think is what the Amazon listing said. That's about $12. That'll do this project quite nicely. You will need some nichrome wire. Now this is kind of where the claim to fame, or at least in my opinion, uh, the claim to fame for this fireworks igniter because in my opinion if you're gonna do four channels that's not really all that much for a big show so the way that I had this set up is you make a coil of nichrome wire alright so this is what the igniters end up looking like now this is 24 gauge nichrome wire costs about 10 bucks for the spool it's 250 feet on a spool it will last a very long time and the reason why uh, 250 feet is gonna last you probably a lifetime is because these igniters are reusable. Now, they're reusable to kind of a limited extent because these coils eventually burn out, but still, these last for quite a few shots. For me, they've always lasted uh, all night uh, on the 4th, and we put on a pretty decent sized show. This would be plenty big enough for uh, someone doing a home show. Uh, but anyhow, before my issues were always with the connection because basically all I did is I twisted this piece of wire around a piece of solid copper wire and that never really uh, well it would get dirty and it would just kind of lose its connection because there's no well you can't solder to nichrome wire so basically what I've done is I've taken the crimped connectors put them onto here I've put some solder into the end of the connector to kind of try to keep the wire from pulling out of there and it seems to work quite well and this one I actually left it and I just set up a microcontroller in order to turn this coil on just long enough to get it red hot and I turned it back off, let it cool again, turn it back on and I just let it cycle for about three hours and the I'm not sure how many uh, cycles that I actually got put on it but it got red hot now a few hundred times at least and it is still working just fine so that's why I have this igniter just kind of set up but anyway that's what they look like and of course this just slides onto the fuse you get back you push the button you have to hold the button for a couple seconds in order to uh, get this to trigger because it uh, what I found is that the fuse lights when this just barely starts to glow red hot uh, so anyway that's what the igniters are gonna look like and we're gonna make those in a minute uh, the other thing that you need for this is a power source the one sort of nice thing about the e-matches that you would buy problem is they're about twenty dollars for a hundred e-matches and that's gonna go pretty quick um, and of course those are only one-time things these will last 
I'm going to say that these igniters will last at least 100 shots a piece. So you have 400 shots per igniter or per module before you have to replace the igniters, which is a pretty easy and cheap thing to do. Uh, but anyhow, uh, the E match is their one time use, but you can shoot fireworks off of like four double A's instead of having to do what I do with this, which is use, I use a 12 volt uh, deep cycle battery, but you don't need something that big. You can just use, say, a riding lawnmower battery because at least here in the United States, you can go into Walmart and buy a riding lawnmower battery for like 20, maybe $30. Uh, they're not too expensive and if you already have a charger for uh, any kind of 12 volt battery that'll work fine for charging a lawnmower battery as well so that's a cheap way to get a power source for this otherwise you can use like an old computer power supply if you can run an extension cord out to wherever you're lighting fireworks that would work as well uh, so anyhow uh, quite a few different options it's going to pull about 8 to 10 amps another thing that you're going to need is a fuse um, not a fireworks fuse but an electrical fuse for protection of this module because I've never had it happen before but it is possible if something goes just wrong these might somehow touch each other though the nichrome wire is really stiff so it'd be kind of hard to get it to do that uh, anyway just in case those touch each other something goes wrong it'll pop that fuse you need I would recommend just using a 10 amp automotive style fuse, but I'm pretty sure I have some other stuff lying around that I'm going to use. And one other thing that's kind of optional, I mean, you don't have to put the fuse in. I would recommend putting the fuse in so it doesn't blow this up, uh, just in case something does go wrong. And another thing uh, in that nature is just a single diode, which I might have one laying around. I might have to pull one out of the box. All right, so one more thing that I'm going to use here is a simple diode. This is a 1 in 4005 diode. And what this is going to do is it's going to give you uh, protection of this module in case you hook up the battery backward. So this is just going to go into the power input of the module there, the 12 volts. And this can be just a simple diode because the current going through this will not be passing through the igniters. It will only be passing through the circuit, which doesn't pull very much power. So anyhow... Uh, that's about all you need for this. We're going to go ahead and start putting this together. All right, so we're going to start with the smaller stuff. So first off, we're going to go ahead and extract that little piece of metal out of the butt connector. Uh, we're going to need eight of those in total, two per igniter. And the easiest way that I found to do this was to take a pair of wire strippers, put the uh, butt connector into the 10 gauge spot, close that down, and then that will open up a gap all the way around as you can see there and then what we can do is take a pair of pliers get it on the end make sure that you don't crush the piece of metal that's in there but if you just grab onto it with pliers pull it apart one end will come off then you can do it again again being careful not to crush that uh, piece of metal it is kind of difficult. The second one always sticks on there harder. It is really, really hard when you're trying to work around a camera, but there we go. So that is how you extract the little piece of metal out of that. I'll show you how to use that here in a minute when we start making the igniters. But I'm going to go ahead and do the rest of these. Again, you need eight of them. All right, so I've managed to get all eight of the butt connector crimps out. Next step is to make our igniters out of the 24 gauge nichrome wire. All right, so I've got our wire out here and we're out in the garage because we have a bench vise out here. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is just put this in here and kind of try to straighten it out some, give it a pull, and hopefully this doesn't work real, real well, but it kind of works to uh, straighten the wire out. So anyway, I'm going to put that in there. I'm going to unspool some of it and just give it a tug. And it helps to get the uh, coils out of it that are already in it from the spool uh, because it is quite stiff, unflexible wire to work with. So I'm kind of just pushing on a little bit, trying to uh, work out whatever kinks I can in it. And it's probably still just going to try to coil back up as soon as I let it go. Uh, this doesn't take very much wire to make one igniter. So anyway, I'm just going to try to 
completely unspool, which is really annoying and uncool. So I'm gonna wind it back up onto the spool, which shouldn't hurt it too bad. And I'll take out a vise, and I just use a nail in order to wrap this around. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna leave an inch or more of the wire sticking out past the vise. And we're just gonna go ahead and clamp down on this. Now I'm gonna try to keep the uh, I'm gonna try to keep the piece of nichrome on the very top part of the vise. Quite difficult to do this. I need one more hand. That'll work. I do believe. Yeah, that'll work good enough. So now all I'm gonna do, quite simple, we're just gonna wrap this around here a few times. And I'll show you how many times I wrap this around in the end. I'll count the number of coils. I've basically just been doing this by feel in the past. Um, it's worked out reasonably well. There is a kind of a trick to it because you want it to get, you want it so it, it can glow red hot, but you don't want it so that it melts. So there's kind of a balancing act there. Now that, and then once you get toward the end, you can kind of push it down, keep it into one coil. Looks like you need to go just a little bit further there. <laughs> All right, so that's probably gonna be about right where it's at. So we're gonna go ahead and cut this off and it's gonna kind of unspool. And I did not hold onto the spool of nichrome tight enough either, so that's gonna get all tangled up, but oh well. All right, so the last thing I'm gonna do with this igniter is bend it around and get it so that the uh, the two ends of the igniter are pointing in the same direction. So there we go, and if we take it out of the vise, you'll see how this has worked out. Should be quite nicely formed around the nail. Doesn't have to be real perfect, just remember all it's gotta do is get hot. And that should be about the right uh, length, length for this. And I'll try to evenly spread out the, uh, the coils there, just using my fingernails, because uh, you don't want them touching each other for sure. You want them close, but not too close. All right, so this should work quite well as a coil. Doesn't have to be completely perfect. Just has to look somewhat decent. And I counted these, there's about 16 or 17 turns on this. So last thing that we have to do is just pull it off the nail and you are done with one igniter. So we've got three more to go. I'll go ahead and get those built and we'll go back inside and start wiring these igniters onto the copper wire. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and get the butt connector pieces stuck onto the igniter. So first off, we're gonna go ahead and trim the wires down quite a bit on these. So we don't really need all that much to stick into the butt connector. All right, so that should be near enough to uh, get this where we want it to go. So the next thing I'm gonna go ahead and do is take just the very tip of the wire, stick it into the pliers on these wire strippers and bend it at a 90 degree angle. Just like so. And that'll help hold the wire in place. So next thing we need to do is actually get the butt connectors. Stick one on here. And it should just kind of barely slide in there with the way that that uh, 90 degree angle's been on the end of the wire, it kinda makes it difficult to get in there, but that's all right. And it's actually probably hitting the thing that's on the inside of these that uh, keeps you from pushing the wire in too far, so we, are, we should be good there. And then what we can do is we can just take a standard pair of wire crimpers, come in here and put 
permanently attach that. Well, it might not be completely permanent, these things. These things don't work the greatest on real thin, solid core wire, especially because these, uh, the red ones I bought particularly because they're the smallest that you can really get. And those are 22 up to 18 gauge, I think, and this, uh, and the nichrome wire that I have here is uh, 24 gauge, I believe. So we'll get the other one stuck on. And I'm gonna go ahead and finish this with the rest of the igniters. And then we're going to do a bit of soldering on this, which is probably not strictly necessary. I think you can get away with doing this project without the soldering. It's just that these wires might come loose and they actually feel pretty solid with just that crimp on them though. And that little uh, 90 degree bend in them is definitely gonna help keep them in. So uh, anyway, I'm gonna finish this and then we're gonna start doing some soldering. Now, soldering these might not be completely necessary because A, the solder is not even going to stick to the nichrome wire, as I mentioned earlier. But what it is going to do is it's going to keep that little hook that we bent in the end from pulling out. So it's going to be uh, quite impossible for this igniter to ever come out of the connector again after we solder it, unless it gets really, really hot, which is probably possible, but you're never going to hold the button down for that long. Uh, but anyway, we're going to go ahead and add some solder to this. And that should also keep any gunk and debris from the burning fuses uh, from going down inside the connection and messing with it that way. So this should uh, make a very strong connection that will last a very long time. So we're gonna go ahead and wet the soldering iron tip and we're just gonna come up here. We're only gonna add a little bit because it might uh, end up flowing all the way down through the connector, which would be quite a pain in the butt to fix. So we're just gonna put just a hair bit of solder on the top of this, which is gonna plug the hole up. And we're going to do the same thing to the other side. So just a little bit of solder. Should do quite good. The nichrome wire is an insulator, so it doesn't actually get all that hot. Just make sure you didn't get solder to go all the way through the connectors, and we should be just fine and set to go. And you can also give these a little tug with a couple pairs of pliers to try to pull them apart, but... Uh, uh, from my experiments, these uh, generally hold together really well. So I'm going to go ahead and finish this up, and we'll start putting on the uh, the actual wires for them. All right, so we've got gone ahead and cut off four links of our zip wire here. Uh, I made these about five, maybe six feet long. Uh, you can make them basically as long as you want to, mind you. This is a 50-foot spool, and we're going to end up needing five pieces of wire. So, you know, you can make them about 10 feet long if you really want to. But uh, keep in mind, you got to try to keep these from uh, tangling up with each other. So uh, maybe don't make them as long as you possibly can. I'm just, I just made them as long as I could see somebody using for this. So about five, six feet, that should be plenty. All right, so we're going to go ahead and attach this wire to the igniter. So we're going to go in here and strip the ends off of that and separate the two wires out. All right, so now that we have the wires stripped and separated, we'll go ahead and twist them up the best we can to try to keep them together. And we will crimp those onto the igniters that we made. Maybe I need to twist this up just a little bit better. <laughs> There we go. Now I'm gonna solder these as well, but uh, really the crimping connection is probably good enough. Now the other thing to keep in mind when you're cutting the, the length for these wires is that you are going to end up cutting just a little bit off every time you replace the igniters. And you should really now, um, the old one that I had, I was replacing the igniters once a year, uh, just once every 4th of July, which uh, worked out pretty nicely. So I replaced them once a year, and I think I mentioned before, the only reason why I really even had to replace them then is because the connections went bad. Uh, this should pretty much fix any issues with the connections going bad, I do believe. So 
uh, making these, soldering them up. They should last a very long time and should be nearly indefinitely reusable, though the coil's eventually gonna go bad, uh, especially if it gets pulled on or blown up by a firework or something like that. But, uh, you know, in laboratory testing, it would last forever. In real world testing, probably not because it's gonna have fire and random stuff shot at it. So anyway, I'm gonna primp, trimp on the rest of these and we'll start soldering them. And then we're gonna start doing wiring with that little module. So I'll go ahead and get back to you. All right, so I've got all four of these all crimped up. Next step is to go ahead, stick them in the helping hands again and do some soldering. Now this will just be the exact same thing as before. Essentially, I'm just gonna put them in there, put the iron on them, get some solder to run down inside the connector. And it doesn't matter if it goes all the way through now, of course. Now, I might have been a bit better off. I would have left some of the copper exposed on the on these wires, but uh, it'll be all right. Melting the insulation slightly, but it's not really gonna hurt anything. There we go. That's gonna be good enough for these little igniters, so. I think that should work quite nicely. It should be very reliable. Uh, there's no way this is ever going to come apart, so it's, it should be the coil is the first thing that goes on these now. So let me go ahead and finish the other three of these and uh, get back to you, and we'll start messing with the actual controller itself. All right, so now I got that stuff soldered up. We're going to go ahead and briefly turn our attention to just the controller, and we're going to go ahead and take the back off of it. So it's just got three Phillips head screws, and this is how you change the battery in it uh, if you ever need to do that. But I'm also going to show you something else that I think should be in this controller anyway. It was in the old one. But something else that you might find very, very useful inside these. And this will just pop apart in half, and yes, it's still there. So this is the entire circuit board for the controller. This is the battery. It's a 23A style, apparently. One of these that they uh, tell you that you can rip apart and find a bunch of batteries inside, if you've ever seen those videos. But um, not a whole lot on this, just like a 8-pin chip on that side, a couple of diodes or transistors or something and a bunch of buttons and then that thing's probably what uh, actually generates the frequency that this transmits on but anyway what's interesting in this is that you have all these little uh, if you can see it you have all these little guys down here now what I believe those are for is actually for selecting what channel this broadcast on essentially so what we're gonna do or what you would do with these is you would solder across either from the top pin to this, uh, well, the top pad to that center circle, or you'd solder from the lower one to the center one. And that way there you can actually create uh, well, quite a few different combinations in here and have different remotes that respond completely independently of each other. So anyway, what you can end up doing by having this channel select option is you can set up a whole bunch of these guys and have them completely independent of each other. So instead of having just a four channel system, you buy 10 of these and have a 40 channel system. Now, it's getting quite expensive when you start buying 10 of these, it's a hundred bucks, and then you have to have all the wire for every single one of them. So it's gonna get uh, quite expensive doing that. But what I'm gonna go ahead and do, since this is my second one of these that I built, we're gonna go ahead and just randomly, I don't think it really matters. This side has a one by it though. So we're gonna go ahead and solder across one of the lower pads to one of the center pads on that. And that is going to change the channel that this remote broadcast on, essentially, is what that does. Well, that's what it should do, that's what we think it's gonna do. We can test that, though. So we're gonna go ahead and put this back together. Battery goes in 
presumably negative side toward the spring. Light should light up. Yeah, that's good. And this will just go back in like so. Maybe. Just like that. Kind of line the holes up so the circuit board. One screw looks like that also holds the case together and holds the circuit board in. So, I mean, whatever works. And we're gonna go ahead and get these guys screwed back in. And then we're gonna go ahead and set up the controller box to be able to talk to the remote. All right, so I've gone ahead and I've attached a DC barrel jack connector to this. So uh, the way you do that, well, you don't really need to do this. You can power it off the battery as well, but we've got plus 12 volts and ground just hooked straight into this. And this is what I'm gonna use to power it temporarily. So I'll power that up. In order to sync the remote, what we do is we hold the button down, that light will turn red, you let go of the button, then you push and hold the button on the remote, and it will start working again. And now, we should have momentary buttons, so what you should, and you should be able to hear it, you shouldn't really need to have any kind of uh, load hooked up to this in order to see this, but you should be able to hear it. When you push the button down on the remote, you should be able to hear the relay snap in, and when you let go of the button, you should be able to hear the relay release. So that's how it should work. If it's not set up like that, what you do is you hold the button down, because this does have multiple modes. You hold the button down, light will turn red, light will go out, and then once it flashes once like that, you let go of it, and now it may have lost the programming again after you do that, but again, just to resync the remote, hold the button down, light will turn red, push the button on the remote, that should work. And now we should be in momentary mode. And you should be able to hear and feel the relay turn both on when you push the button down and off when you let the button go. Now, this is the remote from the old project that I had. And if we push the buttons on this, you'll notice the light does flash, but the uh, relays don't actually turn on and you can't hear the relays clicking and I can't feel the relays moving around. So it is only working with this remote and presumably this remote will not work with the other module. So that is a safety thing. If you're gonna give one of these to your, like your neighbor or something like that, make sure that you uh, set up the remotes correctly. So uh, anyhow, and also this other remote I wanted to show, the old remote that I got, I can actually still press the buttons with the thing uh, with that thing closed, this new one seems to be quite improved in that aspect, and I can't uh, push that down, so that's nice. Uh, just as an FYI, this does have more modes. It has a mode where when you push the button, it just stays on instead of being momentary. Obviously, we want momentary for this. That's why we uh, have it set up this way. If it stays on, that igniter is just going to start glowing red hot, and there's no point in doing that. Uh, but like I showed you how to change, or like I said, it's uh, not too hard to change the modes, and I just showed you how to do, it, do that. Uh, the instructions are kind of useless. Um, just listen to me, not the uh, the, whole, the uh, rather poorly translated Chinese to English instructions. So anyway, last thing to do, make sure that this is the right remote, and I'll put the other one away. And we're going to start doing the actual wiring for this. All right, so I've, got, I've cut off another piece of wire here. I made this one a bit longer. Um, this one is going to be the power input wire. And usually the way that I have this set up is I put the module on top of the table that I've got the fireworks on and then I've got the battery underneath the table. And then uh, that gives this pretty good range because it gets up in the air a little bit. And anyhow, uh, this does have a little cable management slot. It might not be big enough. We might have to cut that out some more. Uh, we're gonna take off the connector that I put on earlier because there's no real point in having that. And what we're gonna end up creating in this is basically a bus system. So these relays, and I'm gonna have to probably get a multimeter out and figure this out it's because it's not really labeled, I don't think. Maybe it is in the instructions. What do we got in the instructions? Okay, so it is in the instructions, but it's uh, very, very faint. You see, they kind of ran the uh, they ran the wires over the circuit board, and you can't see exactly where they're going. But it looks to be that the if we put it this way, 
and maybe I should get the old one out too. I compare this two, but it looks like it's the third terminal is what it starts with. So the third terminal, and then that would be the sixth probably. So the third terminal, the sixth terminal, the ninth terminal and the twelfth terminal are the ones that we're going to uh, hook the igniters to. Alright, so these relays are going to have a normally closed pin, a normally open pin, and a common pin. What we want to do is put 12 volts on the common pin and we want to have um, the igniter on the normally open pin. And what that will do is it will turn the igniter on when you push the button. So. That's quite uh, simple in, in the scheme of things, but first thing we have to do is connect the uh, all the common pins of the relays together and to our 12 volt power coming in. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I might cut off another piece of wire or I might have some other different pieces of wire that I wanna use for this. So I think we'll just cut off a little bit of this and we'll also need to hook up power to this guy, which is gonna be we're gonna do that a little bit, or in a little bit of a special way. But we're gonna go ahead, I'm gonna split these wires apart. We're gonna start using those to wire up this unit. All right, so I'm gonna start by just stripping off one piece of wire, like so. And we're gonna start putting these wires in on pins one, five, eight, and 11, since they're all nicely marked on these boards for us. Okay, so we're gonna start, we're gonna put one wire in on pin two. We're gonna screw that wire in place. We're gonna give myself enough room to kind of come over here with the wire, possibly a little bit of slack. I might just run, no, we don't wanna run these outside the case. I'm not real sure how much room I'll have to kind of hide these wires, but we're just gonna cut it off there, call it good. Strip off a piece for the next one. And this one we can cut back just a little bit shorter because it'll end up meeting in about the same spot. This one is going to go into pin number five on the relay bank here. Again, these are all conveniently labeled ground, 12 volts, and it just starts going one, two, three, all the way up to 12. Uh, if you can't see that on your screen, which I kind of doubt that you can, because looks like my hand would be blocking most of it. So this one's going on pin number five. And the pieces that are, uh, the pieces of wire that are going into the terminal blocks here are being stripped back about a quarter of an inch. And the ones that are gonna be soldered are being stripped back about a half of an inch. And this one is going on pin number 11. Now I'm gonna go ahead and try to twist these together in the best way that I can. Now this is where you don't necessarily need to solder these. You could just put uh, put a wire nut on them and it would probably work nearly as good. Just gotta make sure the wire nut doesn't get loose, you know, and should be good, good to go for life of the unit. But anyway, we'll twist all those together. I might have to get a bigger soldering iron tip out actually and get these, uh, but we're actually not even done with that yet. We want to add in a diode. Now this is gonna be used for powering the unit itself up. So the diode's gonna go on so that the stripe is pointed into the power. So the non-striped end of the diode is gonna go onto this. And I can see one of my wires has already come untwisted from the pack. It's gonna be quite the pain to solder in it. Should have stripped off more. All right, so we're gonna add the diode in here. 
and then I'm going to solder it and then I'm going to go ahead and add in the power input wire. So this is just, the diode's only there for uh, reverse polarity protection. There's no uh, other use for that. It's just in case you hook it up backward, you won't blow up the little module here. So added safety feature, that's all that's really for. I'm gonna go ahead and find a thicker soldering iron tip because that should make this job just a little bit easier. All right, so this should work pretty well. I'm gonna go ahead and find a uh, pair of side cutters and there should be one around here somewhere. I'm just gonna trim the uh, trim the leg of this diode back because it's kind of sticking out far there. And as my soldering iron heats up, I just want to recap what we did here. We connected pins number two, pins number five, pin number that is eight, and pin number 11. We are just connecting all of those together. So anyway, like I said, strip off a little bit more wire maybe, that'd probably help you. And also, don't have a soldering iron, probably not a problem because you can just use a big wire nut on something like this, though. Not sure how well it'll fit into the case with a, uh, actually I'm not even sure how well this is gonna fit into the case. And I may have to up the temperature of the soldering iron just to get this to, uh, just to get this to solder here. Quite a thick bundle. Anyway, that should do pretty good. That's all the wires. Well, it's not all the wires that have to be connected to this. We have to connect the uh, power input wire to it, and then that'll be all the wires that get connected to this. And that is, well, and the wire that goes with the diode, I suppose, but that's a, that's a whole other thing. All right, so we're gonna do this one kind of the wrong way. We're gonna put it on the helping hands first, and we're just gonna tin one of these wires. That might be a bit too much tin. Oh well, it'll work. And then we're gonna take this, cut it down to size. and just melt it right into the rest of the bundle of wires that's here already. And then we're gonna do that to the diode. So we'll cut off a piece long enough to make it on over to our 12 volt input. other end of this wire is going to get routed around this way into the 12 volt pin. And I think I'm actually going to go ahead, I think this bundle of wires will be able to stay on the inside of this case here, something like that. But I'm going to set up the ground on the outside because this case is pretty cramped. It's nice that they give you something for it, but it's just a little bit too small. So I'm gonna cut this wire back a little ways and that's where all the igniters are gonna end up uh, connecting to each other at. So let's see, if we run this out, we might, you know, we'll cut it off about there. Should work well enough. So I'll spread the wires apart on one of our igniters. Come in here with the wire strippers. And we'll start attaching these to the proper pins. So one wire of one of the igniters is apparently gonna go to pin three. I don't trust it though. I'm gonna grab a meter and check that. 
because I don't really trust the instructions. All right, so we got the multimeter on continuity mode. What we're looking for is going in between the pin that we have the, uh, the positive in coming. We want the one that is not connected. So the instructions are actually right in the fact that we need to connect to pin three there. So the instructions will probably be right all the way through in that regard. So now that wire that I just stripped off and dropped somewhere. All right, so this one, this is going to go into pin number three. And we're actually, we're gonna end up using pin number three. We're gonna end up using pin number six and we're gonna end up using pin number nine, pin number 12 in order to put these into. So one wire of the igniter will be going to the relay board. One wire of the igniter is going to be going onto a common ground essentially. So wire number three, or pin number three is connected to one wire of this igniter. The other wire of this igniter we are not going to connect anything to yet, and we're going to grab another igniter. So with that on pin number 12, we still have four wires for igniters that are not connected. So one wire per each igniter has not been connected to anything yet. And those wires all need to be connected to each other and that will be the ground. So anyway, we're gonna, I might actually go ahead and stick the cover on, which would give me a better idea as to how long I need to make the wires. Uh, of course, it might be a bit of a challenge getting that cover back on. Not really sure why they designed the cover the way that they did because they should have known how many wires were going to be coming out of this thing in the hole. I guess they're just trying to make it as cheap as possible. Alright, so I've just kind of temporarily closed the case and got the wiring out of here. Uh, I think I kind of lied. I am not uh, quite completely finished with all the wiring inside of that. Uh, there is one more piece of wire that has to be ran into the case. But uh, anyway, all of these are going to get connected back to this wire here, which is the input ground. Now, maybe I shouldn't have cut that off so uh, short looking at it now. But uh, it'll be okay. We'll just come back a little bit further with these wires and cut them off a bit shorter. So now we're going to go ahead and strip off half inch, maybe a bit more on each one of these. And that should work quite nicely in order to solder all of these together. All right, so now we've got all these wires stripped off. They will have to be combined with each other so I'm not real sure that I can twist five wires at once, but what we can do, twist a few together at a time and then twist the bundles together. So it's something like that. I'll actually bring in a good old friend, the helping hand, so that we can solder that a bit easier. Except when the alligator clip falls out because there's so many wires on it, it's being yanked on so hard. But we should be able to solder these together easily enough. I believe, anyhow. 
We'll go ahead and crank up the soldering iron again. 750 ought to do the trick. And I'm also gonna get one more piece of wire ready to add into this. That will be the ground connection for our this may not be long enough either. I may have to add a couple pieces of wire together, but we'll make it work. Patch it together if we have to. That did uh, damage the insulation for sure. I can see the wires through it, but that's okay because, like I said, they're all the same. It doesn't matter if they touch each other. And we'll just slide this over and shrink that down eventually. I might test this before I actually shrink that down, but uh, anyhow, last step is to get that piece of wire back into the case and possibly I might just have, have to add one more longer piece of wire to that in order to get it to actually reach but we'll be all right we've got some more wire yep looks like we're definitely gonna have to add some to it turn the soldering iron back on try again strip a bit more of this off and grab another piece So that we'll put a piece of heat shrink on that as well smaller piece than that but uh, that should work out just fine and that's just gonna have to make it around the corner and into that terminal and it'd be great if I didn't have magnets on everything And then this is going into the ground. Not a single color-coded wire in this thing. And that basically finishes the project off, minus putting some insulation on it. And it also needs, it needs a fuse on the other end for one thing, actually. So we're not quite done yet. And we need to figure out which one of these is positive and which one of them is negative. Because, again, no color coding, so. Next thing we're going to do, we're going to come in here, we're going to split the other end of the power cable apart, because we haven't done anything with that yet. And we'll strip this off a ways. And we're going to test and see which one of these is positive, which one of these is negative. In order to do that, we will use a continuity meter or the continuity setting on a multimeter. So that is this setting. We'll put the positive probe here and then we'll probe to the ground. All right, then that one is negative and it should not be connected to this one. All right, and also if I set this on diode and put this on positive, let's see, we're gonna set diode check and we should be able to measure the voltage drop of a diode to the positive 12 volt pin because we put that diode right in here and we are measuring 0.573 volts so we do have a diode voltage drop in there so that's all working if we measure just resistance across those two pins let's see we need that one's resistance 
might be measuring the resistance of my fingers as well, but quite a high resistance, something like 30K, 30K ohms, which is fine. So we're measuring the resistance that A, my fingers, or B, this control circuit board is adding. Uh, what you don't want to see there is when you put the probes across it, you have a really low resistance because that would indicate that something is wired wrong or something is shorted out and the igniters are turned on without the button being pressed, essentially. So that's basically that. I need to shrink down the heat shrink and I need to put some liquid electrical tape on it. And we need to get a fuse in line with this wire and we need to put some ring connectors on it so that we can connect it to a battery. All right, so I went and salvaged a fuse holder off an old circuit board. Holds onto this fuse really quite tightly, so um, we're just gonna go ahead and solder this right in line with it. And uh, I'll put a piece of heat shrink over the fuse. And that should actually be uh, good enough to hold that in place without too much of a worry. It is a 10 amp fuse, like I think I mentioned uh, before. Uh, I think I mentioned before I would recommend going with just a standard automotive type fuse because that would make uh, quite a bit more sense than using a fuse like this because the automotive fuses are real cheap, easy to replace. You can get holders for them. Um, this one, uh, this is what I have laying around. That's why I'm using it. But anyway, this is gonna go in line with the positive, which is this wire of the uh, input power. So we're gonna strip off some wire here. And we're gonna do this the method of putting some solder on the wire and then adding the wire to the fuse holder. The uh, fuse holder's already got enough solder on it for this, so. is good enough. So that takes care of the safety devices. Uh, this we're just going to put a piece of heat shrink over it that should uh, hold it in place quite well I think anyway. The other one is basically set up the exact same way so I think it'll work fine for this one as well. Actually upon further inspection I'm going to modify these a little bit. I'm going to push that wire all the way down into the uh, raw into the holder close as I can get to uh, basically surface mounting it so uh, that way there I can cut those tabs off and make it a little bit more round and it should also flow solder a little bit nicer and over the entire connector like so and that should make a really solid connection and should work really quite nicely. So I think I like that quite a bit better. All right, so that's what the sort of end product looks like. I'm just gonna take this other piece of uh, big black heat shrink slide it on over this and this is actually an indicator fuse so a little pin will pop out if it blows all right so in order to cap this project off here well before we start doing testing anyway we're going to go ahead and put these ring terminals over the uh, the ends of this I'm also going to solder the ring terminals on again not necessary but it'll make it last longer and make it really unlikely for these two uh, ever come off so we're gonna go ahead and rip the insulation off of these guys kind of like what we did before with the uh, butt connectors so we've gone near full circle already hopefully this will come off yeah there we go no problems I think these are the biggest uh, 
ring terminals that I have for 18 gauge wires, so that's why I'm using these guys. I might have some non-insulated ones as well, but we're just gonna use these ones anyway because they should work just fine. Now these ring terminals, we'll be able to put these on to uh, connectors for a car battery and we'll be able to put these on to the bolts for a lawnmower battery. Um, some other power options, like I said, you could use an old computer power supply. Just hardwire that straight into here or use whatever connectors you want to on it. Doesn't really matter. You could also use a dedicated power supply just for this. Dedicated just 12 volt, like say 12 amp power supply, maybe a little bit more than that, just to be safe. That's if you can get power to it. You can also use a cheap UPS battery. Buy those online. Of course, the smaller the battery that you use, the less shots you're gonna get off of your igniter. And now with them crimped on, we'll solder them on. Get. I should have slid a uh, piece of red heat shrink on one of these in hindsight. I'll just use a piece of red tape, I guess. But uh, there's a couple of connectors on the end uh, for connecting to the uh, battery. We'll do some basic tests on this. We'll put some labels on the, uh, the igniters so we know which one of them is button A, button B, button C, and button D. And we will do some range testing on this because I'm sure some people are going to want to know about that. All right, so we got the four igniters uh, just kind of suspended in the air with the uh, helping hands here. We've got this uh, module down here. I've got a couple alligator clip leads on here uh, providing power. So when I turn this on, we should get that little green light on the controller and nothing should heat up. All right, that's good. We've got power now. Got the remote at the ready. We're gonna go ahead and hit the A button and hold it. And that one starts glowing red. Nice puff of smoke as the uh, the oils or whatever manufacturing oils uh, come off of that. We'll hit B. That's this one. Nice and hot. C is that one. And D is this one. So it does take a second for him to heat up, but that's all right. Uh, so let's just check something here. Uh, I know this battery uh, maybe not as high as what a big car battery would put out in terms of voltage, but we can come in here with an amp clamp and I'll just turn the power off so I can zero this properly. We'll see how much current these, uh, these actually draw. So the circuit board itself might be pulling a little bit, either that or it might not be zeroed properly. It's not really that critical, but... All right, so that's basically just the circuit itself, 20 milliamps or something. If we hit one of the buttons, this should spike right up. Eh, seven amps we're drawing, holding down the A button. I may have made these igniters just a wee little bit long. They're taking a bit longer than I like to heat up, but they're not bad. The nice thing with them taking a long time to heat up is when you hold the button, they won't completely melt down. You'll see we're drawing seven amps, something like that, to uh, fire all these. This one's actually taking about eight from cold, seven. So the 10 amp fuse should be sized fairly good for this. There we go, about seven amps on that one as well. So that's working quite beautifully, actually. So uh, one last thing I'm gonna further test on this just to make sure 
we'll take the old, the remote for the old unit and just make sure that this isn't setting anything off and you'll see the current doesn't come up, so that's all good. And I believe if you hold down two buttons at once, it's not actually gonna try to do anything stupid, so let's make sure. No, it's just uh, ignoring it, so that's good. So, anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and get some electrical tape and I'll show you how I put the labels on the old one that uh, it seems to be holding up uh, fairly well. All right, so before when I did this, I actually used black electrical tape and a silver Sharpie, but I couldn't find a silver Sharpie, so I've got a black Sharpie and white electrical tape, so should work about the same. But anyway, what I'm gonna do is just take these out of here, wrap a length of this tape around it, figure out which one it is, and then go ahead and label it. So we're just gonna go ahead and take tape, lay it out so there's a little flag kind of sticking out, maybe down a little bit from the igniter because it's going to uh, get some sparks shot at it. And we'll just bend it back over itself basically. Should be able to make a decent little flag, just like so. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that to the other three, and then we'll figure out which ones they are again and put the labels on them. All right, so all the labels are on it now. I even put a piece of red tape with a plus on it for the uh, positive leg here. We've got A, it's just written on there with Sharpie and it's written on both sides, so can't miss it. But A, B, C, and D. And really with the uh, black wires and the white tape, that uh, works out quite nicely because the white stands out. You can see that label. Of course, the, uh, they're probably gonna get kind of dirty with some time, but that'll be all right. So the only thing really left to do is to shrink all the heat shrink tubing. All right, let's get the case back on and light some fireworks, do some range testing. All right, so I'm gonna try to add just a little bit of strain relief to this case uh, in the form of hot glue, just kinda, well, I put a zip tie around here, which should keep all the wires together, and I'm gonna put a bit of hot glue on it to keep the uh, wires from pulling out. I mean, it seems pretty solid, but uh, I don't really wanna get the, uh, or have the wires rip out of there. Didn't have any issues with the other one, but. We're not gonna take any chances with this. Just a little bit of glue, not a lot. Don't wanna make a big mess on it. And also the case is wanting to pop apart down here, so. We're gonna put just a dab of glue right there and then smooth that out some. We'll do that over here as well, I think. And that should hold the case together real nice, so also gives it some rubber feet. So, dual purpose thing there. And now we're gonna go ahead and take it outside, do some range testing, make sure it works to actually light fireworks, which I know it will because I've built one of these before, but uh, that'll pretty much end the video. I saw some smoke. There goes one.
Well, those really don't put off very much. That was B, I think. I'm back up a ways and see if we can get it. There we go. They take a while to light off, I can see that. Maybe partly due because the voltage is probably being dropped quite a bit. All right, so this is where we are now. We are lighting smoke bombs off. Still pretty far away, but not very. We've got something to go ahead and prop that thing up on and see if it doesn't uh, help out a little bit with the reception. All right, so the only difference now is we set it up on top of a milk crate. We're gonna press one of the buttons down. We'll see if we can't get something to light off here. We haven't moved back too much further from where we were. Yep, there we go. All right, so we're a little bit further back still. Let's see if we can get it to go off. It's taking a while to heat those coils up. Nope, that one went quick. Give you some idea. Putting that up on a milk crate actually does make quite a bit of a difference, even though it's only maybe a foot off the ground. All right, move back a bit further. Let's see if we can't get another one to go off. This may be the limit. Nope, nope, there we go. Might actually be taking that long for the fuse to burn off on the uh, smoke balls as well, because we can't tell exactly when the fuse is lighting. We're just seeing when the, when the smoke comes up. And we'll zoom out again. That's plenty fun. All right, so we're on our last smoke bomb and our last test. This is probably way further than you would really need to be away from it, uh, but anyhow. We'll see, hopefully it still works. It is only, like you said, it's only a foot off the ground. It might do even better if you put it up on a table. That's more like three, four feet off the ground, like what you'd light fireworks off of, but we may or may not get it to one last time here. All right, so at this point, I think I'm just gonna slowly walk forward until something goes off. And we'll see, I'm just gonna continue to hold the button down. Should probably zoom out further than that because the camera's gonna end up swinging everywhere. Yep, oh, there we go, right there, it's lit. So if I zoom all the way out, that's right there. We'll go ahead and measure the two distances and see what we end up with. As this is pretty far. All right, so this is what the actual test setup looked like. We got the battery pack over there. That's just hooked into our igniter, which is sitting on top of a milk crate. And then the wire just kind of came out over here. So next thing I want to show, as I said, these igniters are reusable which is most certainly true, but after a while they'll start to get some black burn up fuse gunk stuck on them, and in this case maybe some uh, stuff from the smoke balls, but I just want to show you how you can clean that off real easily because, like I said, basically infinitely reusable. But what you can do is you'll get some of this, uh, this actually does have quite a bit of black sort of tar looking stuff on it, if you just press and hold down whatever channel you have, let it glow red hot for a while, it'll burn all that stuff off. You 
and you see there and now when that cools down have a nice clean coil again all right so after we put this thing up on the milk crate we got about 320 feet worth of range on it which is i'm going to say more than what you'd ever really need so uh anyhow everything worked quite flawlessly i think it was uh it was taking a decent while for these to heat up it seemed like uh in order to uh light the fuse i think that's partially due to the fact that i'm using this lithium battery pack that can't put out a whole heck of a lot of current plus it's going through thin alligator leads and we also weren't uh we didn't see when exactly the fuse was lighting so it was taking some time for the fuse to go all the way into the firework and actually burn as well so that all adds to the time but uh, once you actually hook this up to a good 12 volt lead acid battery this will uh, light off a lot faster or at least it should all right so in conclusion what we've done here so we've taken roughly 35 or 40 dollars worth of parts in the form of this relay module, some zip wire, a bit of nichrome wire, some random butt connectors and other stuff like that. And we've turned it into a fairly simple fireworks igniter. Of course, I'm not responsible if you guys hurt yourself with this or build bombs or something crazy. Um, anyhow, some other tips, uh, like I showed you, clean these igniters off when they start getting some black gunk on them quite simple that should uh, should make them a little bit more reliable and of course when they get really black you can't get the fuse into them because there's so much junk on them but that's just an easy way you can do self cleaning on them usually you don't have to do that too often but uh, uh, keep this thing off the ground like I said I put it up on the table that I was lighting the fireworks on uh, put it up on a milk crate that made a huge difference in range so definitely worth it to do that uh, so anyway, this is just going to get bolted onto whatever battery you have or whatever you can, you don't have to use the connectors. Obviously you can just use whatever 12 volt power source that you have. Could be an old computer power supply. If you can run extension cords out to where you're going, or it could be some form of 12 volt lead acid battery. This, the thing that I was using to test, it was lithium and it's, uh, it really isn't meant to put out that much current uh, and keep the voltage high enough on it. But uh, anyhow, that's how you make one of these fireworks igniters. That should have been a fairly in-depth tutorial that you should be able to follow quite simply. Uh, this one versus the other one, I quite like the way that this one looks just because all the wires are nice and neat. The other one I used twisted wires on that were black and white and they just kind of went everywhere. These wires are nice and flexible. They want to, they go where, they, or they stay where you put them. The other ones kind of like to coil up and just go everywhere, and it's kind of a mess. So I'm really liking this one versus the old one. But uh, so hopefully you guys found that useful or interesting. Go ahead and build one yourself if you like. All right, I'll go ahead and put links in the description to all of this stuff. Uh, hopefully by the time that you're watching this, the links will still be good. But uh, anyhow. That's how you build a little 4Q fireworks igniter, and as I kind of mentioned earlier, this idea is kind of scalable. You can buy multiples of these boxes, and all you have to do is set those remotes up a little bit differently. And that way there you can actually have something like a 400Q uh, firing system. If you really wanted to, that'd take a lot of work to build, but... Uh... Alright, so anyway, that's about it for now, guys. Bye.